Welcome. Today's program, The Art of Felix Lemberski, features a talk by his granddaughter, Jelena Lemberski, co-author of the recent and highly acclaimed memoir, Like a Drop of Ink in a Downpour, Memoirs of Soviet Russia. Jelena will be introduced by Georgetown University professor, Ori Scholtes, who has known her for many years and has written extensively on the work of Felix Lemberski. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. I'm now honored to introduce Jelena Lemberski and Ori Scholtes. Jelena Lemberski is an author, an architect, and a project director at the Uni Unitera Foundation, promoting art and mutual, mutual understanding around the world. She has curated exhibitions and edited several catalogs of her grandfather's art. Her writing has appeared in World Literature Today, Cardinal Points, and The Forward, and she was recently interviewed on National Public Radio, Radio Boston and BBC. Ori Scholtes teaches at Georgetown University across a range of disciplines, from art history and theology to philosophy and political history. He is the former director of the Bnebret Klutznik National Jewish Museum and has curated more than 90 exhibitions across the country and overseas. He has authored or edited 25 books and several hundred articles and essays. Recent volumes include Our Sacred Science, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, The Ashen Rainbow, Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust, and Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture, as well as recently growing up, Jewish in India, synagogues, ceremonies, and customs from the Bnei Israel to the art of Siona Benjamin. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat. Welcome, Yelena and Ori. Ori, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Rachel, and a particular pleasure to be with Yelena today and to be with all those people, wherever they are, listening in on uh, this broadcast. I want to very briefly introduce Yelena by way of uh, two paths. One is to talk for a few seconds about uh, Soviet art. And with that in mind, I am sharing my screen with you, I hope. And I'm going to enlarge this to remind you of the following datum. And that is that in the period leading up to World War I and the Soviet Revolution, so the tail end of the Russian Tsarist period, and in the aftermath of World War I and the early Soviet period leading up to the end of the 20s and the early 30s, art was flourishing in all kinds of spectacular, new, different avant-garde ways uh, across that national landscape, very diverse. So for example, most of you will recognize this as an image by Marc Chagall, the fiddler, it's from 1912. And of course, it is surreal. You've got this dude who is dancing, as it were, above the roofs, so larger than everything around him. He's got a green face. His violin is turning col colors, and so on and so forth. By contrast, this work by uh, Malievich from um, about 1915 gives us a black suprematist square, almost the antithesis of what Chagall was about, but also innovative avant-garde, whoever heard of painting up to this point, that would be a black square of some sort. Or on the third hand, this image by um, Tatlin, which is just a maquette for this enormous tower that he had in mind to construct in 1919, creating a whole new architecture of architecture. And one more image by El Lisitsky, uh, from about 1925, from his series called Project of the New, Prown, where he talked about the issue of 
squares and curves and rectilinear straight lines and so on and so forth in imagery that falls far outside what would have been traditional thought with respect, with respect to painting. And in his work in particular, there was also writing that was often within, embedded within the work. So that we're talking about a whole new range of visual language with an endless array of new kinds of vocabulary. Then we arrive to the period after Lenin, the struggle between Stalin and Trotsky, the emergence of Stalin as the leader of the Soviet Union, and by 1932, his demand that all Soviet art, all art that is appropriate for the state, in the state, by the state, by artists within the state, anything that wants to be art in our Soviet Union has to be what is called Soviet socialist realism. So we have, for example, here, a, a painting of Stalin himself by Isaac Brodsky, but even more characteristic of the Soviet socialist realist style, we have a very avuncular Stalin who is surrounded by these joyous scouts, these kids with their nice crew cuts and their shorts, handing him this wonderful bouquet of flowers. And again and again, the kind of imagery that Soviet socialist realism demands is joyful, happy children, in a beautiful, happy landscape, a completely idealized perspective on this wonderful new paradise known as the Soviet Union. Mind you, this is during a period when literally millions of citizens have been starving because of the new economic policies that Stalin has put in play. And yet we see them, not just the children, but the farmers, the workers, the peasants, everybody is joyful, everybody is young, everybody is healthy, everybody is happy. It's as terrific an image as you could ever hope to have. And that's the kind of painting and that's the kind of sculpture that you will do if you are to be an artist within the regime that will extend from 32 all the way to 1988. Which means if I'm an artist who wants to do something else, I live in what was referred to uh, in the 1980s, sorry, the 1970s as a two world condition. What I present to the outside world conforms to what are the requirements of Soviet socialist realism. What I produce that feeds my own soul is hidden, it's nonconformist. And perhaps no one sees it, or only a reliable, trustworthy group of people sees it. There was a movement called Apt Art, APT as an apartment art, where there were little exhibitions going on in apartments of avant garde artists in the 70s who only allowed their trustworthy friends who aren't gonna report on them to see these sorts of things. For Jewish artists during this period, one might refer to a three world condition. Not only am I trying to figure out how to balance between doing what will be acceptable to the regime and doing what will be acceptable to my soul, but if I have a Jewish identity and Judaism and religion in general is not something accepted by the state, are there ways in which I might embed aspects of my Jewishness in the art that I produce. When Yelena Lembersky showed up at my door when I was directing the Kutznick Museum in Washington in the 90s and brought me the work of Felix Lembersky, I was blown away among other things by the way in which he had managed somehow to dance on the border among those three worlds. And what I hoped to do was present an exhibition of his work. Alas, I didn't do that because I left the museum before I had the opportunity. I was, however, privileged to study his work, thanks to Elena, to see his work that she had stashed up in Boston in this little apartment shared with her mother so that there was barely room for them because the art mainly fill, filled the apartment. I was a privilege to write a few things on it, but nobody knows his work better than Elena who is not just his granddaughter and the primary archivist of his work and an architect in her own right, but an art historian in her own right, someone who is knowledgeable about art history, about the history of art in the Soviet Union and about the art of Felix Lembierski, about which we are privileged to hear. Yelena, the floor is yours. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ori. Thank you. It's uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Ori. It is a great pleasure to present with my dear friend of many years, Ori, and to be part of this wonderful 
uh, event series at um, Fritz Asher Society that brings a really tremendous body of work of many different artists who sometimes would not be seen or heard uh, anywhere else. Um, before I begin, I want to ask um, the listeners this question, and I know you cannot answer it, but I want to just put it out there and perhaps during Q&A we can discuss this. But imagine you had inherited or you received a body of paintings, a large body of works, and everyone who is familiar with this art will tell you that this is a very important art. But for political reasons, you cannot show these paintings in public. What would you do? People often tell me just how fortunate it must be to have these paintings, but art is, uh, to be living art has, uh, comes with tremendous responsibility. And what to do uh, is the question that my family has asked for now several decades. Um, I grew up in Leningrad in the 1970s. And um, as Ori had uh, shared, I grew up in a small two bedroom apartment with my mother and my grandmother. And right there in that apartment, we had several hundred paintings and drawings by my grandfather. If you were to visit um, Russia in the 1970s, you would see, find some of his earlier work in the museums and uh, in the exhibitions. But many of his later non-figurative work um, could not be exhibited because they did not conform to socialist realism. So guests came to our home um, on the days when they would visit. My grandmother and I moved the furniture around and she brought paintings one by one and leaned it against the wall in our living room. And everyone who saw these uh, paintings said that these were historically significant, culturally important, a milestone in Soviet art. And yet there was no hope for them in the Soviet Union. So my mother and my grandmother decided that all of us will, would emigrate and take this art somewhere where they would be free um, to be shown to people. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. So last year, can everybody see it? Yes. Uh, so last year we published um, a memoir, like a drop of ink in a downpour, which tells the story of our unexpectedly long nine-year journey out of Russia. Oh, but before um, we published that memoir, we published um, the catalog of uh, Felix Slimbersky paintings and drawings in 2009 that in it was the first comprehensive uh, book about his art, and it began the gradual um, rediscovery of his work in the United States, then in Russia, um, and now around the world. Um, I want to begin the slideshow from um, at the midpoint of his career in 1958. This was the moment in Soviet Russia when uh, five years after Stalin uh, finished his run of terror, and there was a moment of hope. Um, and Libersky's art was transitioning from his earlier um, almost monochrome, classical, dark, somber, realist paintings um, to bring in expressive color, dynamic, uh, diagonal um, composition, uh, flattened perspective. And um, he was returning to his roots in modernism. Um, this trip to Nizhny Tagil was his first, his third trip. Um, the first time he visited uh, the Urals in the 30s when he was collecting material for his thesis painting. Uh, this painting on the right 
is of the industrial workers that he created in the late 30s. Um, this, his thesis painting was dedicated to an industrial uh, plant in the Urals and a tragic accident that took the lives of two workers. His second visit, um, yes, and he had, he had def uh, defended this thesis uh, during World War II in the besieged Leningrad in December of 41. Um, his second uh, visit was a year later when um, he was evacuated uh, from Leningrad uh, to the Urals, suffering from dystrophy and um, a wound that he had received in the defense of Leningrad. And as he recovered, um, he worked uh, at the industrial plants as an embedded um, journalist artist, um, creating portraits and images of uh, home front supporting uh, the war against the Nazis. Uh, these uh, images are of his students. Um, in the Urals, uh, he had, while during the war, he created an art studio. A, um, he taught art, he created a gallery art museum that became an art museum uh, of Nizhny Tagil. And when he returned to Leningrad, his uh, paintings uh, gradually progressed, um, bringing in more and more color throughout the 50s. This is the portrait of his wife and his uh, daughter, my mother. So if you were um, if you were to visit Leningrad um, in the 1950s, you would see um, his paintings. You might you might visit the Museum of Revolution and you would see this painting. First, uh, News Revolution 1917 was autobiographic. Limbersky was five years old when revolution came to Berdichev in Western Ukraine, a predominantly Jewish town where he grew up. He is the same age, he was the same age as this little boy in the foreground. The revolution in Ukraine was preceded by three years of World War I. It morphed into civil war and then into famine. Um, so his first seven years, was he was surrounded by violence of that compounded war. His revolution is not heroic as it was expected of the Soviet uh, propaganda. This painting shows muddy roads, uprooted, uprooted civilians, and uncertainty. He had considered painting uh, this theme during uh, his student years at the academy. Um, in, he, in the besie at his speech at the besieged Leningrad during the, his thesis defense of uh, industrial plant, he said he mentioned this initial idea, and he said he wanted to show the joy of Jews liberated from the violent gangs but the joy was too complex among human emotion and he could not ex realize that task. So he completed this painting and um, it was on a permanent uh, display at the museum where it remained for several decades. Um, and at the same time in his studio, there was a different versions of revolution, chaos, ambiguity, and the painting that almost borders an abstract expressionism. If you kept uh, walking down Nevsky in Leningrad in the 1950s, 60s, you would see, you might visit the Palace of Young Pioneers, a beautiful um, Anichkov um, palace um, next, uh, next to Fontanka. And then this uh, grand foyer, you would see these uh, portraits of my uh, mother. She is right here, and here is her, and here she is, um, and her school friend. This was uh, a gift for her 10th birthday. And in the background, um, 
you would see these uh, other characters. And perhaps uh, some of you can recognize who they are. Um, in the painting on the right, uh, his mother, my mother, uh, got his daughter, shows the violin to um, Zhdanov. Now, she never played violin, but uh, Zhdanov's name became synonymous with vicious uh, repressions of the art of musicians, of Shostakovich. Um, and here, his daughter is uh, bringing this uh, to his attention. So this never, never before and never again did Limbersky paint the leaders. But in this moment, uh, in 1955, uh, two years after Stalin's death, there was the moment of reckoning and the moment of opening up and the promise of a better future. Um, and I want to show these paintings also because, um, because um, I want to show how easy it would have been for uh, Limbersky to be an official artist, how effortlessly he could create Soviet socialist realism. Uh, this art was generously rewarded. Artists were the elite in Soviet society. They had um, access to the most prestigious academic positions, to travel, housing, everything uh, that could have imagined. And he had a choice, every artist had a choice to either conform and live a comfortable life or to reject all of this and um, create uh, a different kind of paintings. And as an aside, I want to say that in the 90s, 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was another hopeful time in the Soviet U in Russia. Um, and during that time, Soviet, uh, the people were cleansing themselves of their Soviet past. So these three beautiful paintings, uh, according to the staff of the museum, were scraped off the walls and completely destroyed. So what was an official art became ostracized, banned, and um, rejected, um, sadly. So the history repeats itself. Um, but in the 60s, uh, if you came to Limbersky's studio, you would see a very different kind of art. In a speech um, from the 19, uh, in 1956 or 57, he said, until recently, we could not speak honestly because we were told that art cannot have contradiction, contradictions, that we must create lacquered, polished heroes. To create such heroes is to steal from people. This is not the essence of the truth. Uh, this is uh, Limbersky, uh, my grandfather, and his wife Lucy, my grandmother. Um, and I want to say that women, wives, are often overlooked in art history. They wouldn't be my grandfather's paintings without his wife. She was his friend, his love, his supporter. When he stopped taking state commissions and could uh, not make a living with his paintings, she supported the family so he could work freely. When they had no money to buy new canvas, she patched the old pieces of canvas and sewed them together. She put the canvas on stretchers. She prepared it for his paintings. She was his first critic. Um, when he became gravely ill, she took care of him. And when he died in the 1970s, she took care of his art. Um, she went alone to the United States to bring this art um, in 1980. And she is a part of everything that um, he had created. Um, artists are often classified according to the last place uh, they worked. So um, Marc Chagall is French, Limbersky is Russian. But in fact, um, Limbersky was born in Lublin, Poland, to a family of Polish Jews. When World War I began, his family became refugees. They moved east uh, to Ukraine. He grew up in Berdychev. Um, when he began to study, he began to study art in Kiev in the 1920s. He began his independent work in Ukraine in the 1930s. 
Um, and only then, in 1935, he moved to Leningrad. In his autobiography, written a quarter century later, Lindersky says that Ukrainian landscape and the art of the first uh, years after the revolution, the art of avant-garde, were among his greatest um, influences. And I want to take um, just a few uh, minutes and briefly talk about Ukrainian and Jewish avant-garde in Kiev. Uh, the 1920s, Kiev became the center, center of tremendous burst of creativity when Ukrainians, Jews, and ethnic Russians worked together to create radically new revolutionary nationalist art that was rooted in their respective traditions. Two major institutions were formed. Uh, Jewish Kulturliga, where Limberski studied. So this image is of the studio around the same time that he was a student at the Kulturliga Art School. Um, and these works are by Mark Epstein, one of the founding members, and Limberski's teacher, uh, who remained uh, the head of the Jewish Arts and Trade School of, uh, until 1930, long after Kulturliga was dissolved. Um, the participants of Kulturliga were also included Mark. Uh, Chagall, El Lisitsky, um, Issachar Bear, uh, Rybak, and many wonderful artists, all of whom were suppressed in the Soviet Union. Uh, this is the works by uh, Issachar Bear Rybak, uh, who emigrated to Paris, um, and his collection is now in um, Israel. Um, the second institution was uh, Kiev Art Institute, where Limberski studied in the 30s. Um, among uh, people who taught there were Malevich, Tatlin, Baichuk, Mikhailo Baichuk, Viktor Palmov. Um, these images are Palmov. Um, he's unfairly been forgotten. Um, and I want to show his beautiful work. Um, all of these people taught in uh, Kiev Art Institute, and Limberski was very well familiar with their work. Um, and I want to show this sequence here, um, show parallels between, so all of this art was repressed in during terror. Many of this, all, most of these artists died very young, uh, either executed, Mikhail Bachuk was executed for nationalism, uh, or emigrated or changed. And there was no uh, access to see this work anywhere in the Soviet Union. So the whole generation, this whole movement was erased. But um, my grandfather remembered this work from his earlier years. And in the 60s, I think he was drawing, he was asking himself, how would this art uh, continued? Should it, um, should it not have been interrupted? And I think he established in his later work a conversation with these people. I believe that he had the duty he felt the responsibility to preserve their memory and to take the next step to develop their work. So the painting on the left is Viktor Palmov, who died in 1929. And this painting from the 60s painted in Russia. But I believe that you could see the parallels between those two works. It's a conversation between the two generations. Um, the image on the left is Mark Chagall, uh, a cover uh, for um, Soro, um, that was published in Kulturliga in 1922. And I found this um, little sketch uh, in, our, uh, in our collection, which I originally thought was just a mistake, Limberski was looking, but as if you, you could see the two heads um, that form a letter eight in Chagall, is, um, I think Limberski is maybe remembering these works and looking for sort of resolution. Image by Joseph Chekhov, uh, the boastful rooster, illustration for Markish Peretz um, from 1922, and Limberski's painting um, from the 1960s. And I think he is asking, he remembered this work. Uh, Markish Peretz was one of the Yiddish painters, uh, I'm sorry, Yiddish authors who were executed in 1952 uh, by Stalin. I think he was asking how would those illustrations, how would these images look like? Should those people live? And how would it be, how should it look like after World War II terror holocaust? And here is another Mark Epstein's painting, uh, I'm sorry, Mark Epstein's uh, drawing. These two have nothing in common. 
uh, Mark uh, Epstein's uh, dressmaker is humorous image. And uh, Limbersky is one of the last works, um, is a very serious painting. But if you look very carefully, in fact, they have similarities. There is a uh, sewing machine on the, uh, on the left. Uh, there is this coat hanger that becomes a vertical element in Limbersky's work. There is this table. I don't know if he was able to see this illustration somewhere in the library in the 50s or 60s, or all of this was in his memory. Um, the seamstress, Limbersky seamstress, has many hidden symbols. There is a letter Shin um, in the, sort of the symbol of Tifelin. Uh, whether it's a man or a woman, it looks like a um, keeper. And uh, in, on the side, there is a picture which was a symbol of Levi in Jewish traditional representation. Uh, Kulturlik uh, painters were, here, here it is, Kulturlik painters, uh, artists were looking for inspiration to um, Jewish traditional tomb, uh, stones, stone carvings, uh, wood carvings, uh, children drawings, uh, and letter forms. So all of this is, um, something that Limbersky returns to uh, in his later work. So in 1932, socialist realism is enforced um, and all other art is banned. Um, I want to go back and show uh, Limbersky's earliest drawing in our collection, a uh, painting, a uh, drawing of his uh, father. Um, and it is a realist drawing, wouldn't you say? Uh, here is the father sitting on the chair, but um, please take a look at the father's uh, shadow. It is looking in a different direction. And uh, on top of that shadow, there is other shadows and it forms the kind of a portal, the doorway. And so is this a realist? A work of art. The Limbersky grew up in Berdichev with a very strong um, Hasidic tradition, Hasidic mysticism. Um, and he read uh, books by Yiddish uh, authors, people like Der Nister, which formed um, his uh, understanding of the world, that there is always a spiritual presence uh, in parallel uh, to the uh, existing physical world. And I think that this um, drawing is the key to understanding all of his later art. These are his uh, parents. Uh, his um, mother was a pianist. Um, when after world uh, when world war one came to lublin where they lived uh, they became refugees um, she became they moved to berdichev where she was a caregiver at the orphanage and then a teacher they remained in ukraine when the nazi germany uh, attacked uh, the soviet union ukraine uh, Berdichev fell in the first weeks of the war. Jews were moved to the uh, ghetto. And in September 1941, uh, 20 to 30,000 people uh, were executed. Limbersky was in Leningrad then in the Urals when the Nazis were driven out. He was looking for his parents and there was no information given about what had happened. Uh, in 1945, Stalin banned the discussion of Holocaust. Um, and so when he uh, wrote to the Red Cross, the response was they were missing, no further information. Babi Yar began, uh, became the uh, symbol, um, became synonymous with Holocaust in the Soviet Union. Limbersky began to work on this painting at the end of the war. Uh, he created three, uh, three works. 
uh, in the body are serious. So here, I don't know if I should describe it, but it's, um, so there are people, so the Babi Yar was a site near uh, Kiev where, um, where Jews were murdered by, by the shoot, uh, the shoot the, the, that was turned by the, uh, into a shooting ground. Um, so there are Nazis on the, on the left, and there is Nazis next to a, a gas van on the right. All well, the gas van was not in Kiev, but it was brought by the Nazis to the Belarus. Belarus. Um, but he gives the main stage to the people. Um, and what I find striking is that the most alive um, in this moment uh, of imminent death uh, there is someone who is reading Shema. There is protest, um, people raising fists, um, even as they are uh, dying. Um, there are shawls uh, because the um, prisoners, the people had uh, dug their own graves. This is the earliest uh, of this series. Uh, it is a large painting done on the two uh, sheets of paper uh, in oil. And I will not just, it needs to be seen. And the last one is 1952, um, the year of, um, the last year of Stalin terror and the year when Yiddish painters were um, uh, executed. It took tremendous courage uh, to paint Holocaust uh, work during that time. These paintings are considered the earliest uh, artistic representation of Babi Yar. And during Limberski's time, lifetime, he was never able to show these paintings in public despite of many attempts to include them in various exhibitions in his retrospective in 1960, he was never allowed to show this work. Um, and now uh, they've been published and uh, shown all over the world. And they are his, probably his best uh, known work. Uh, the images from his Babi Yar, um, he, so the symbols from his earlier Babi Yar paintings, um, he brings back in his later work. Uh, the raised fists from the 1940s reappear again in his uh, paintings of industry. Here are the chimneys turned into this raised uh, fists. Uh, the shawls. Uh, become a symbol in his later paintings that seemingly were dev devoted to industry. Um, here, please uh, take a look. It's a, it's a very complex, they're small paint uh, images, but they're very complex. Um, there are shadows in the background, shawls, and there is this uh, little image of the, the fire This is my overlay of um, this work. The inability to speak freely. Um, here he shows um, people with uh, mouth closed, covered. This image at the uh, painting at the train station, um, a black woman and a white woman um, created at the time uh, of the civil rights uh, movement beginning in the United States. He was familiar uh, with, uh, with the civil rights movement. And the painting's composition reminds the uh, lunch counter sit-ins 
the photographs of which he would be able to see in the Soviet um, print. In this work, I believe he draws parallels between um, the struggle of the black community in the United States and the struggle of Jews, artists, uh, dissidents in the Soviet Union. And these are the sketches and many paintings in the series. He returned, he uh, continued to return in his memory to um, Ukraine of his childhood. Uh, here's the painting I showed earlier. Um, in his Babi Yar, uh, there is a small faint uh, image of a house and a tree. And here, 30 years, 25 years later, he brings it in full color. Um, this painting is titled Midday Crucifixion. And I want to ask uh, why, where is the crucifixion here? And why is the Jewish artist turned to Christian theme? And of course, um, Chagall's White Crucifixion, 1938, and Limberski's reply. Um, Post Holocaust. And I want to finish uh, with this uh, painting uh, called Lejacia, uh, Reclining Woman. Um, I remember in the many years ago, uh, Ori visiting our apartment in Cambridge, where my mother and I lived, and we had the paintings there in the 90s. Um, I remember showing this uh, painting to Uri, and I talked about um, the hidden images in this work, the, uh, the shoulder that forms into a ghost, um, the shards, the yellow shards that um, anchoring the figure. Um, and I remember Ori um, walking to this painting and pointing out that it was uh, signed vertically in the back. And um, you turned this painting. And so here it is. Um, I think that's the, the end of my show. Thank you, Elena. That was wonderful. Um, I have two questions with which I would uh, love to begin, um, and then we'll see what other questions there might be from others. Um, one is, uh, of course, the Babiar series, which is just spectacular, and particularly the way the, the, the upraised arms, it reminds me, of course, of, of Goya, the 3rd of May, 1808. Where in Goya's case, we've got this lineup of, of Spaniards, and there's the one in front with his arms upraised being gunned down, and we see the French soldiers. But in Babiar, of course, we see the upraised arms, but there are no soldiers, which is to say the victimizers of the victims are invisible to our eye. And I wonder if he's thinking about that at all and, and about the way in which because I remember visiting the site, uh, I guess at the end of the 80s, early 90s. And of course, there was no specific reference to the Nazis, neither were those, or was there a specific reference to the Jews, neither was the, the little monument there where the event had actually taken place. It was a full half kilometer from the actual site. And of course, I remembered that before Yevtushenko wrote his poem, there was no monument at all. Um, so how much of this do you think was going on in Lembrowski's head when he was painting that extraordinary, extraordinary triptych, right? Mm -hmm. a triptych, after all, a traditional Christian form of painting that symbolically, typically 
references the triune nature of God as Christianity understands God. Um, I always think it interesting when a Jewish artist uses cryptic form, particularly in the context of an event like the Holocaust, uh, of which Babi Yar is, a core, of course, a, a subset. And the, the ones gunning the Jews down were not Germans, they were Ukrainians. Um, how much, I mean, what, what, all this stuff, how much of it was he thinking about? And, and do you think he was thinking of the Goya painting at all, or is that, or is that something out of his unconscious, or is that just something I'm seeing which wasn't intended to be there? Well, I, I think that he was familiar with Goya and uh, definitely saw his work in, in the Hermitage, Rembrandt and many other classical masters. I think it's very, you're bringing up a very interesting question. So, of course, the triptych uh, became a triptych over time because one painting was created after another in, in the course of um, probably what five, six uh, years, seven years. Um, and so it's it's very interesting that it lines up to be a triptych uh, and kind of an evolution of time uh, and then especially leading up to his Christian symbolism and his later work and the work like uh, uh, crucifixion and, and and reclining which I did not point out but it's definitely a Christian pieta uh, hidden in this in this reorientation um, but um, I think I believe that in the in the 40s, he was painting his parents. He was painting all the people he knew and had lost in Berdyshev, in, in Kiev, his teachers, his the people who surrounded this whole Jewish world, his whole life was lost. Um, I don't think that he was uh, considering political ramifications or making a statement. It is very interesting what um, you're bringing up, Ori, is that it's us. Right, the, the the executioners are in a way us, the audience. Right, we are standing from the position. We could be both uh, people uh, who are victims, or we could be the executioners, depending on where we position ourselves. And that's the choice I think we make every day. Wonderful. Um, before asking my second question, there are two questions in the chat. One asks uh, where the link for this webinar to send it to Russian and Ukrainian friends would be found. And my answer, I think, is that you turn to Rachel for that because it will be made available through Fritz Asser Society. Is that correct, Rachel, at a certain point or whatever? For this webinar, we'll actually receive, uh, in the follow-up email, we'll receive a link to the recording. So Great. I'll get and, it. and then, Yelena, there was another question regarding um, is it possible to see any, any of his paintings in person in a museum or a gallery? Uh, of course, there's your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, uh, are there places at all back in Russia in the former Soviet Union? If someone were, this might not be the right time to go visit, but if one were to go visit there where one, one could see any of this stuff, or is it gone as you illustrated those three wonderful uh, Soviet socialist realist leader yeah works are gone so to answer to answer the the question where to see it in the museums i would say please speak to the museums i i think my my grandfather's dream my grandfather's vision was to have his paintings in the museums where everybody can see it and my mother's uh, dream was to create a museum of his art so we are still working on this and every few years i ask myself what is the future and how can we make this uh vision a reality but uh we had exhibited um these paintings in the past uh, after the catalog came out there were several exhibitions in, in across the united states and in uh pushkin house in london uh most of this work uh non-figurative work has never been shown past uh the uk so it was never see, uh, shown in Europe. Um, by the years, uh, we had planned to make, um, to send these paintings to Kiev uh, two years ago. And the exhibition was uh, planned. We had a contract, we were ma making real strides, uh, working with the Babi Yar Holocaust uh, Memorial Center in Kiev. Uh, and the exhibition was supposed to be open a year ago in the spring of 2022. So. Um, it is now put on permanent hold. Um, 
yeah, this Babi Yar paintings have never been shown in the countries of the Soviet Union to this day. So let me ask you about the memoir, if I may, since um, you mentioned your mother, your grandmother, uh, you mentioned in, in, in brief how uh, she came alone to this country with all that work. And I know a bit of that is covered in the memoir. Tell us a little bit about this book that has been so euphoriously reviewed, really. And I know it's up for a couple of awards right now. And even if it doesn't get them, I award it personally. Tell us about it. Well, so the memoir is a separate story. Um, when my uh, when we when my mother and I finally were able to come to the United States in 1987, we made a decision to never speak about our past. So all of our friends, including you, Ori, people who we knew for many many years, 30 years, never knew about what had happened. Um, and what had happened is a long story, which we don't have time to tell. But basically, uh, my mother made a decision to emigrate, to save these paintings. And um, we were able to secure our visa in 1981. We were planning to leave, apartment was almost empty. Um, and then I returned from school um, and saw three men from the Soviet police raid our home. They turned everything upside down. And when they left, they carried away our visa. My mother was charged with the crime. She was innocent. Um, I was 11 years old when she was sent to prison. Um, and that is the story of the memoir. That's the beginning of the memoir. I invite everyone to acquire a copy because it's really quite compelling. And it's a unique memoir because we, we, we read about these experiences from two angles, that of Yelena's mother and yet that of Yelena, who, as she says, the, at the time of the event she just described was all of 11 years old. So it's uh, more than a bit compelling. And you're right, it's, it's a separate story, except that it's important for further context and understanding how Lembierski's oeuvre survived at all, because it would probably all be gone if you guys had not managed, had the courage, the guts, not mm -hmm. only to leave, but to leave and somehow get all of that stuff out with you because that was not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, I think so to, re I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, to, re to, to return to, to, the other, uh, to the question of saving the arts and where it could be um, seen right now, um, there are um, several uh, paintings in the Zimmerle Museum of Art in New Jersey, uh, right. Northern Dutch nonconformist uh, uh, collection of Soviet nonconformism. And um, there are a number of works in Nizhny Tagil in the Urals, uh, the museum that he had founded uh, during the war. And that museum had done really tremendous work to promote um, him in, in Russia. There are several works at the Russian Museum in Leningrad. Um, and I believe that there are still a few in the museums across the Soviet Union. But of course, all of that work is earlier and surrealist. So there is two different Limberskis that people know in, in Russia and, and here. But yeah, I do hope that one day we will be able to show these paintings in, in person. And so this is the next project for, for my work. So one thing is to save it to preserve it, to restore it, to conserve the works. It's just, it requires constant upkeep. And there are different artists. I, I think for Limbersky uh, art, um, you know, some, some, some painters paint for themselves, other people paint for commercial success. For Limbersky, I think it was essential to have this conversation with his viewer. He said that I want to create the kind of works that you would see over and over and over again. And when you think about it, you think I have not seen everything. So for these paintings to be a living art, they have to be interacting uh, with yes. people. Are you familiar at all with the, the Savitsky collection in Nukus in Uzbeka, northern Uzbekistan? No. Because he was a an artist, but more so a, a voracious collector, a kind of Soviet version of Norton Dodge, 
who uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s uh, managed to acquire thousands of works, mainly avant-garde works done during that period down in Uzbekistan. So Stalin was not even aware of what was going on there. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't Leningrad, it wasn't Moscow, it wasn't Kiev, it wasn't centers where he could keep his thumb on making sure people did Soviet socialist realism. So you had a continuation of avant-garde. And um, when I first visited there, hoping to bring that, that work to the United States, but the financing fell through and it never happened, it was all stored in what had been the Department of Agriculture. But subsequently, they built a magnificent museum. And I wonder, I would think that that might be a site of, of interest for displaying Lembioski's work, albeit obviously there's something to be said for showing it in a place that is more accessible to a visitor audience than <laughs> Nukus. Um, but I just, I just bring that bring that up to you as, as some sort of a thought anyway. I had visited uh, Samarkand when I was a child, 10 years old, and I think it's the most magic place that yeah. I've ever seen. So any excuse to go back to Uzbekistan. Yes, although Nukus is not magical. <laughs> it is not Samarkand, it's the, the other side of Uzbekistan, as it were, yeah. kind of a, a, a dust bowl town, as yeah. it were. <laughs> Anyway. But I think the paintings probably would stay here for now. And yes, we'll so work on and something coming from you. Go ahead. Yeah, so Sara is actually sending a link uh, uh, of Lemberski's work as the Zimmerli Museum. So right. I'm, I'm putting that into into the chat for those who would like to see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Yelena, why do you think he called it crucifixion? Um, that wonderful fence post. And I noticed everything is blaringly, glaringly yellow, which is certainly yeah. a familiar color in the history of Christian art uh, yeah. as the color associated with Judas and the Jews. It could be, it could yeah. be. It's also gold. It's also yeah. the color of gold, the gilded yeah. icons. He was looking at the icons, the traditional painting, and the Ukrainian icons, the Russian icons. Um, light sunlight i i don't know i don't know how to look at it, it depends on the on the day i see it as a positive and hopeful time or 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 the or the yellow the yellow of the jewish yellow star so um the titles of his paintings i have to say are very very um problematic because each painting has multiple titles and many of them are untitled and uh, my grandmother attempted in the 90s to attribute some of the works um to, to, in, to put them into certain series and so some of the paintings are uh, attributed to industrial series but they're also uh i believe holocaust and so i think that what he was looking at really is to create find a comprehensive symbol comprehensive universal image that could speak about his to his own experience mm -hmm. as a jew as a as a, someone who lived through multiple wars and there but also that could become a symbol that would be representative of industrial workers, of, of the whole entire experience of um, that time. And so did he actually name most of them? No. Or we have them through your, through your grandmother? And, Combination. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. sometimes they would create titles uh, in the catalogs as they were trying to put together sure. exhibitions. But then people who knew him, would say no 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 this is not the household store it's the is the necklace <laughs> or something so it's or or it will say matronin's dwar uh, matrona's yard uh, which is the title of solzhenitsyn poem but of story but it really clearly something else and it looks it reminds me of more of vasily's grossman jews with ukraine without the jews so it's it's complex yes it is <laughs> archaeological excavation yeah a multiple world condition as multiple a... world condition well i believe our time as the shrinks say is up <laughs> <laughs> this is an absolutely uh splendid a wonderful pleasure for me as i'm sure it has been for our audience and uh, rachel do you have any last minute things to share with us yes of course <laughs> Of course, yes. Uh, actually, uh, thank you 
Yelena, and thank you, Ori. This was very enlightening, and there are so many more questions uh, um, about the work, and I think we'll all go to the Simile Art Museum's uh, uh, website and check out more of the work and hope that it will come out in exhibitions in the years to come. Um, I want to, uh, since you brought up the uh, memoir, um, Ori, I want to uh, mention, I will also send that out in the follow-up email. Uh, the publisher of the book has actually agreed to give uh, those who order um, uh, the book until the end of the month will receive a 25% discount with the code Lambersky25. Uh, so um, to our audience, which um, I find very exciting and um, so we can all order the book now and uh, learn a little bit more about your story, uh, Jelena's, and uh, also, of course, your family's story. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, being with us today. Um, take good care and stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Ori. It was really wonderful to be with you today. My Thank pleasure. you. Bye. Bye.